test, test, restream, test. Because I hear nothing here. Find your name plate. Hi. Hey, Sarah. Can you please unmute Restream so we can test the sound? Please assume you need to ask Chris. Yeah, he's on the group chat. Can you just check the WhatsApp group? Thanks. Vazi.
the name in the particular thing. Seeing Joe back. One, two. So this is a little test of our system. We're calling out to Dr. Moetti, joining us today from Brazzaville. I'm going to unmute your microphone, Dr. Moetti. Do you hear me okay? Oops, sorry, I think I unmuted the wrong one. Okay, I think uh, you might need to unmute on your side as well, your microphone. I've, I've just there. done that, Perfect. so can you hear me? I can hear you very well, thank you. Do you hear me okay? okay? Yes, I hear you well. Excellent, thank you. So we'll just put on standby for the moment then. Okay, that's fine. Thank you so much. I'm glad you could join us today. Okay, great. Me too. So I'm going to stop my video for a minute. Okay, sounds so good. Can...
test, test, restream, test.
Hello, journalists on the line. This is Chris in Geneva. We're still doing a few tests before our event gets started. Um, we have another guest joining us from, from Ethiopia, from the African Union. I see Dr. John Makenga Song on the line. Dr. John, if we can test your audio when you have a moment, that would be great. And yes, hello, I can see you. Dr. Jones. Oh, hello, um, we can hear you now. Can you hear us? This is Geneva calling for uh, Gladys. Yes, 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 we can hear you. We can thank hear you, you so much. Uh, thank you. This is a quick audio test to Dr. Sao. Do you hear me, sir? This is a quick audio test for Dr. Sao. Do you hear me, sir? Professor Sao. Yes, I hear you very well. How about you? I you hear, hear you very well. It's like you're in the room with us here, sir. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to mute you again. Merci beaucoup pour votre participation aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry, Lindsay, one sec. Okay. Okay. Yep, sounds good. How is how are they starting to move?
Hello, everybody, and we appreciate your patience waiting. Today we have a very special day. Um, welcome to WHO Press Briefing on COVID-19. We have a packed agenda with a number of special guests. Uh, if you're listening, remember you can listen in, whatever, in multiple languages. Uh, remember that if you wish to listen to Arabic, go to Korean, and if you wish to listen to Hindi, go to Japanese. But without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros to tell us exactly why today is a very special day. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Thank you, thank you, Margaret. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today is Africa Day, and that's why Margaret said it's a special day, an opportunity to celebrate Africa's vitality and diversity, and to promote African unity. Africa Day celebrates the birthday of the Organization of African Unity, which was established on May 25th, 1963, 57 years ago. And its successor organization is the African Union, which was established in 2002. Today, on Africa Day 2020, we mark the successes and progress made throughout the African continent. This year, celebrations are more muted because of, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. So far, although around half of the countries in the region have community transmission, concentrated mainly in major cities, Africa is the least affected region globally in terms of the number of cases and deaths reported to WHO. Africa has just 1.5% of the world's reported cases of COVID-19 and less than 0.1% of the world's deaths. Of course, these numbers don't point the full picture. Testing capacity in Africa is still being ramped up and there is a likelihood that some cases may be missed. But even so, Africa appears to have so far been spared the scale of outbreaks we have seen in other regions. The early setup of a leaders coalition led by the African Union under the chairmanship of President Ramaphosa of South Africa were key to rapidly accelerating preparedness efforts and issuing comprehensive control measures. Countries across Africa have garnered a great deal of experience from tackling infectious diseases like polio, measles, Ebola, yellow fever, influenza, and many more. Africa's knowledge and experience of suppressing infectious diseases has been critical to rapidly scaling up an agile response to COVID-19. There has been solidarity across the continent labs in Senegal and South Africa were some of the first in the world to implement COVID-19 diagnostic testing. And beyond that, they work together with Africa CDC and WHO to extend training for lab technicians for detection of COVID-19 and to build up the national capacity across the region. Furthermore, health clinicians, scientists, researchers, and academics from across Africa are collectively contributing to the worldwide understanding of COVID-19 disease. For many years, and from the outset of this pandemic, WHO has been working throughout our country offices to support nations in health emergency preparedness and developing comprehensive national action plans to prevent, detect, and respond to the virus. With WHO support, many African countries have made good progress in preparedness. All countries in Africa now have a preparedness and response plan in place compared with less than a dozen in the first few weeks of the pandemic. 48 countries in the region have a community engagement plan in place compared with only 25 countries 10 weeks ago. And 51 have lab testing capacity for COVID-19 compared with 40 countries 10 weeks ago. WHO continues to support Africa with other life-saving supplies. And as of last week, we have shipped millions of personal protective equipment and lab tests to 52 African countries. In the coming weeks, 
we plan further shipment of PPE, oxygen concentrators, and lab tests. However, we still see gaps and vulnerabilities. Only 19% of countries in the region have an infection prevention and control program and standards for water sanitation and hygiene in health facilities. And disruption to essential health services, such as vaccination campaigns and care for malaria, HIV, and other diseases pose a huge risk. I now want to introduce my sister, Dr. Sidi Moeti, who is the regional director of the Afro region. Dr. Moeti, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. I'm very pleased to join this celebration of Africa Day today, and especially pleased that it's to be in the company of Professor Samba So and Dr. John Gengasong, who are special envoys for on COVID-19 in Africa. Thank you so much for having joined us, Samba and John. As Dr. Tedros says, this is the 57th anniversary of the creation of the OAU which later became the African Union. And I would like to join him in commending the leadership of the African Union and the actions of African political leaders in response to this pandemic. Not only have they rallied strongly and created at the country level, all of government and all of society structures and mechanisms, but we've also seen the mobilization of the African private sector, both those who are in Africa and those who are working in the diaspora. I'd like to also add my thanks to our fellow countrymen in the African diaspora, in the US, in the UK, in other European countries who have joined our work, our virtual work in training, sharing their knowledge and skills in proposing innovations to contribute to the response to the pandemic in Africa and in mobilizing their networks and their resources and in stating their determination in continuing to support their families from wherever they are. Dr. Tedros has highlighted some of the progress that's been made in recent months. And these achievements have built on years of work led by governments with the support of WHO and our partners like the Africa CDC to prepare for and respond to severe and widespread epidemics, and also to work on strengthening and making more resilient the health systems in our countries. In our efforts towards eradicating polio, for example, we have used uh, geographic, in, in, geographic information system technologies, and we have engaged communities who are able to alert the authorities when they start to see cases in their midst. I'd like here to pay special tribute to African communities. It was said by Dr. Tedros that uh, our leaders have put in place some measures to control the, the pandemic. We have seen African countries take very tough decisions to put in place some of the control measures that uh, are aimed at physical and social distancing. And this has been at a high cost, they have recognized and acknowledged on the economic level in countries, but also very much at the level of uh, our individuals and households. In a survey that we carried out in partnership with the Africa CDC and the Resolve Foundation, we found in, on interviewing people in African cities, in 28 African cities, that they accepted the need for some of these measures, although many of them recognized that they would be very tough on them in their households, particularly if you take into account the proportion of African people that work in the informal sector where you need to be out earning your money in order to be able to put food on the table. But they have stated that they understood the need and were ready to comply with some of these measures, which were very challenging. I'd like to very much commend and thank them for that, because we think that it's thanks to these measures that we have started to see not the kind of evolution of the pandemic in Africa that we were projecting in some of our projection tools. We are working with our partners, and I would like to thank here our humanitarian and United Nations partners for the joint work that we are doing in the 13 African countries that are affected by conflict and uh, insecurity. 
just to remind that the theme of Africa Day this year is silence in the guns in the context of COVID-19, which reminds us that we have in this disease a common enemy. And while one country is vulnerable, all are at risk. And it reminds us again to continue to work towards having peace so that the kind of risks that people encounter in insecure areas towards their health can be reduced. So I'd like to thank very much those partners that are working to support the most vulnerable African communities in very difficult, sometimes conflict-affected regions and say that we are there, we are committed to work with you. I'd end by wishing all of Africa's people, whether we are in Africa or elsewhere, a happy Africa Day, and let us continue with the amazing solidarity that has seen us progress thus far in our response to the pandemic. Thank you very much, Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Sidi. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on this very, very special, special day. Uh, I, so please um, stay with us uh, for some question and answer if uh, you have time. I now want to uh, introduce uh, Professor Sambaso, Director General of the Center for Vaccine Development in Mali and former uh, Minister of Health of Mali and uh, special, my special envoy with a particular focus on supporting the Francophonie African countries. Um, the, Professor Sambaso, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank WHO and all the partners and colleagues uh, uh, here, yourself, Mr. DG, and uh, uh, Dr. Sidi, and uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Special Envoy uh, John DG of the CDC Africa. And thank, your, thank you to your communication team. It, it was very difficult to reach me out. I am so far away, <laughs> not in Bamako, in a very remote area right now. Uh, I would like to really especially thank them for trying so hard. I only would like to, to share a few points with you in, on this very special day, which is Africa Day, and which is, is so normal. Uh, thank you so much. This is such a great idea uh, for WHO to arrange such a, a press conference. So my first point right now for Africa, my concern is that there is a lack of testing leading leading to a silent epidemic in Africa. So we must continue to push leaders to prioritize testing, to prioritize tracing, to prioritize treatment, and to prioritize uh, prevention. So uh, such a day is a good day to echo that. And the second point is the health systems in Africa can be weak and easily overwhelmed, lead to COVID-19 <coughs> deaths, and but may well also lead to a, a raise in, in maternal mortality, infant and child mortality. And so we must work to strengthen the health system. The impact of COVID is being seen in African health system and is being seen in many other domains, uh, such as uh, schools and social and economy. But health, is, health system is number one. So Africa must be, my third point, uh, at the forefront of vaccines and treatment research. Uh, but it must be conducted ethically and, and with country ownership and to ensure the trust of population. So I have to say a solidarity trial organized by WHO and co-sponsored by WHO and country, country members is a very good example but we need more communication. Even with just that solidarity trial sometime, we are having such a difficulty, such a trouble at the government level. Sometime there is less communication. And, 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 and right now in Africa, we are seeing lots of anti-COVID research treatment or vaccine treatment or even serosurvey uh, group that are bringing bad remorse against those kind of great actions. We don't want to hear again, there is no data from Africa, no data from Africa. We have to generate, locally generate data from Africa, by Africa, in Africa, for Africa. That's what we need to do. So then communication is my fourth point. 
we need to communicate with communities. When I say communities, not only capital cities, not big cities, communities, real life, very, very far remote areas. So it's so important in this very politicized time. We have to be very careful. We are all being politicized somehow uh, at this very moment. So my last point is that it is important to, uh, 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 it is important regarding the support, uh, uh, the support, the call, support the call uh, for a people's vaccine and the call from world leaders on a COVID vaccine and, and the demand uh, for all vaccine treatments and tests be uh, patent free, mass produced, distributed fairly, and made available to all people in all countries free of charge. I will stop here and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Sambad. Thank you so much indeed. And now I will move to the rest of what I would like to say uh, for today. As part of our continued response to the pandemic uh, globally, WHO continues to work aggressively on research and development. As you know, more than two months ago, we initiated the solidarity trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy of four drugs and drug combinations against COVID-19. Over 400 hospitals in 35 countries are actively recruiting patients and nearly 3,500 patients have been enrolled from 17 countries. On Friday, The Lancet, as you know, published an observational study on hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine and its effects on COVID-19 patients that have been hospitalized. The authors reported that among patients receiving the drug when used alone or with a macro uh, lide, they estimated a higher mortality rate. The executive group of the solidarity trial representing 10 of the participating countries met on Saturday and has, uh, has agreed to review a comprehensive analysis and critical appraisal of all evidence available globally. The review will consider data collected so far in the solidarity trial, and in particular, robust randomized available data to adequately evaluate the potential benefits and harms from this drug. The executive group has implemented a temporary pause of the hydroxychloroquine arm within the solidarity trial while the data, the safety data is reviewed by the data safety monitoring board. The other arms of the trial are continuing. This concern relates to the use of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in COVID-19. I wish to reiterate that these drugs are accepted as generally safe for use in patients with autoimmune diseases or malaria. WHO will provide further updates as we know more, and we will continue to work night and day for solutions, science, and solidarity. I thank you. Margaret, back to you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. So now, as Dr. Tedros said, we will have the questions from the media. I should let you know that with Dr. Tedros is Dr. Mike Ryan, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, and Paul Malinaro. So we have a rich range of expertise here to answer your questions. Um, you know, to raise your right hand using the icon, um, use the icon to raise your hand to ask your question. And please, because there are so many of you and so many questions, please, one question per journalist. Now, because it's Africa Day, I will give the first question to Simon Ateba from Africa, Today News Africa. Thank you, thank you for taking my question. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Please go ahead, Simon. Okay, thank you. This is Simon Ateba from Today News Africa in Washington, DC. 
Uh, my question goes to the Dr. Tedros and all the panelists from Africa. Africa has not seen the type of spike that we've seen in other countries around the world. We've seen, um, you know, a different, you know, countries that recorded like 100,000 cases in one day. But right now in Africa, we have only about 100,000 cases for all the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. I was wondering, does this have to do with the experiences that African countries have had in treating other infectious diseases, or does it have to do with weather, or does it have to do with malaria? Because most people in sub-Saharan Africa that I know have at least beaten malaria for many times in their life. Thank you. I, Dr. Tedros? Oh, Dr. Mawetti. Uh, okay, thank you for that question. Um, this, this is a question that has been asked over many months. In, in fact, right from the beginning when there was, uh, <coughs> there was relatively, there were very few cases in Africa throughout the month of, uh, of January, even into the beginning until the middle of February. Uh, I can say that it is very unlikely that this has anything to do with malaria, first of all. And then secondly, that by the time we started getting importation of um, cases into African countries, it started first in Egypt and then in uh, Algeria and eventually in some West and, and, and other countries, of course, in South Africa. It was some time into the experience of the rest of the world. And very soon after countries started seeing cases, they put in place some of the measures, starting with um, abolishing flights from so-called hotspots of the time, and therefore reducing some of the traffic of people who might have been infected. In addition to that, relatively soon after they started seeing um, community transmission, and in many cases before they started seeing community transmission in some of the Eastern Southern African countries, countries put in place even more radical measures of physical and social distancing. So stopping social gatherings, mass gatherings, closing schools, and eventually asking people to limit their movements. At the same time, they have scaled up and they, they, they did a very good job at the beginning of point of entry screening, meaning at the borders. And this had been built from the experience with Ebola, for example. So they started screening people traveling in and were able to, if not catch somebody with a temperature, at least track them down and their contacts. So we think it's a combination of these measures, the physical distancing measures, as well as the public health, contact tracing, isolation measures that countries have put in place that we are seeing this uh, slower picture in Africa. It's true that, and it was stated by uh, Professor Samba So, that there have been challenges with testing in some of the African countries, especially with, with access to the testing kits that are very difficult to find on, on the international market. We have seen some countries ramp up their training, their testing, like Ghana and uh, Senegal. But in those countries, we have not seen and then a similar huge increase in positive cases. So we think there may be some underestimation, but we don't think there's a huge underestimation of the cases in Africa. And uh, are using also our influenza surveillance network to monitor uh, on the syndromic level what sort of cases might be being underrepresented as COVID in countries. So we think it's the measures put in place and the fact that the virus arrived later in Africa when there was already some experience in other regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moeti. I now have a question from, from the Spanish radio network, Victoria Garcia. Victoria Garcia, you on the line? She's not? Could you unmute yourself, please, Victoria Garcia? We'll move to the next question. That will be Ankit from India today. Oh, Hello. You. Yes, please go ahead, Ankit. Yeah, my question is on air travel. 
India resumed its domestic air travel today. There is quite a debate going on if the middle row of the airplane should be left empty. Based on what we know so far, what is your advice on this? Does leaving the seats empty has any benefits? Does it actually help? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's it's great to see that um, there's a there's a slow approach to uh, initiating uh, travel again. I know many people are are trying to ensure a safe safe travel as we resume uh, economic activity. Um, what we what we know about uh, COVID-19 and what we've been talking about up here uh, for many weeks now from the beginning is that this comprehensive approach, comprehensive package of activities, is really important to be able to curb to stop. Uh, transmission between people. Um, and the virus transmits between an infected person through respiratory droplets when they're in close contact with one another. Um, our recommendations are uh, of, of one meter or more distance between individuals. Um, we've recently had a, a systematic review that's been conducted to look at uh, influenza, uh, influenza-like illness, uh, coronaviruses, and COVID-19, and has found a strong protective uh, effect of a distance of one meter or more. And so that's important. Um, if someone is ill, uh, as you know, we recommend the use of, of medical masks in that, in that context um, or and for people who are caring for somebody who is ill. Um, but the, the distance um, that no, we know can be protective is one meter or more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. The next question is from Kai Kupferschmidt. Kai, are you on the line? Yes. Yes. Please Thank go you ahead. very much for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask about um, what you just said about the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine arm of the solidarity trial being paused. Um, I know it's supposed to be one question, but just so that I understand it, this applies to both the chloroquine and the hydroxychloroquine, I expect. And could you say a little bit more about, you know, what exactly the executive board based its decision on? You mentioned the Lancet paper. Was that the main reason? Or do you also have data? Does the DSMB have data from the solidarity trial itself that concerned them? Just to understand a little bit better what, what the decision was based on. Thank you for that uh, question, Kai, and uh, I'll start, Mike may wish to add. So as you know, the solidarity trial is, has an oversight mechanism, an independent executive group that's made up of members uh, from the participating countries, very senior experts. It has a representative of the Data Safety Monitoring Board, the trial statistician. So there's an independent Data Safety Monitoring Board. And then there's a larger steering group that's composed of two senior representatives of each of the participating countries. Now, when we saw the publication in The Lancet, um, while it's still an observational um, reporting of observational data, but from multiple registries and uh, quite a large number, 96,000 patients, of whom about um, 14,000 or so had treatment with uh, chloroquine with or without uh, macrolide or hydroxychloroquine with or without a macrolide. There was also a lot of questions coming from our own principal investigators in countries. And we knew that the regulatory agencies in many countries were also discussing these data. So the steering committee met over the weekend and decided that in the light of this uncertainty that we should be proactive, err on the side of caution, and suspend enrollment temporarily into the hydroxychloroquine arm. And to answer your other question, we only have the hydroxychloroquine in this trial. We are not using chloroquine. Um, the plan is now to look at data from the solidarity trial. As uh, the DG mentioned, we have about 3,500 patients randomized. Of course, not all of them have outcomes. Um, we will also be writing to the principal investigators of all the other trials that are ongoing. We're aware of at least seven other trials, including the UK's recovery trial that are using hydroxychloroquine. And we will look at all the published evidence so far. We know there are very few and very small randomized trials. And that's why it's so important to continue to gather evidence on both the efficacy and the safety 
of hydroxychloroquine because we know that the, the evidence from observational studies, however large they may be, are still subject and inherent to bias. And therefore, it's really important to have well-conducted RCTs done in large enough numbers in order to definitively answer this question because we want to use hydroxychloroquine if it is safe and efficacious, if it reduces mortality, reduces the length of hospitalization without increasing the adverse events. So this is a temporary measure that's been taken by the steering committee. The Data Safety Monitoring Board will meet again as soon as we've collected all the data from both published and unpublished uh, um, studies that are ongoing. And then we will review the decision again in the, in the matter, in, in, during the course of the next week or two. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Swaminathan. Oh, Dr. Ryan's going to add a few just, more remarks. Uh, just, possi just possibly add, to clarify for, for, for everybody, the, the, the steering committee and others who are over the trial, uh, including WHO, we don't see the data. That's the purpose of the trial, is that uh, nobody gets to see the data or interfere with the process. Uh, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, though, will be looking at the data uh, and then will inform uh, if there are any issues. And that the, the caution that, uh, that, uh, that Sumi refers to is, is, is purely to await a, a, a rapid analysis by the Data Safety Monitoring Board. And we would expect that if no signal is found of any uh, problems, then we would continue to randomize and to use the, uh, the drug. Uh, this has purely been done as a precaution uh, in order to be able to have that data reviewed and have the proper process. This process has been carefully put together uh, and, and, and other trials that are currently underway have very similar processes associated with them. So this is a standard practice in order to be able to ensure that we're, uh, we're uh, using the processes as designed with the partners in the trials and under regulatory guidance. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Uh, we'll have another, give Victoria Garcia from Spanish Cadena Network another opportunity to ask her question. Victoria Garcia, can you unmute yourself and please go ahead with your question? I have some problems with the mic. Can you hear me right now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, I sent you the question in writing, but I do it again here. It's much better. My question is for Dr. Ryan. In uh, which scenarios are you working right now? Is still there the possibility of uh, an important second wave of uh, infections, or you discard more and more the possibility of that important second wave, especially in countries like mine, Spain, with uh, severe confinement measures in, in place right now? Um, thank you. I, I, I think uh, it, it depends where you are in the world. Uh, right now, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not in a second wave. We're right in the middle of the first wave uh, globally. And if we look at the data from Central, from South America, as was spoken about, for Africa, for South Asia, uh, and for many other countries, we're still very much in uh, a phase where the disease is actually uh, on the way up. Uh, we congratulate countries. Uh, like Spain, who've uh, managed to uh, to contain and suppress the disease transmission. Um, but as we've seen in the seroprevalence studies, and Maria may wish to speak to this, the, the actual number of people who've been infected in each country remains relatively low. So it's, it's uh, when we speak about a second wave classically, what we often mean is that there will be a first wave, the disease by itself effectively goes to a very low level and then occurs a number of months later. What we're concerned about, and that may be a reality for, for many countries <clears throat> uh, in a number of months' time, but we need to be also cognizant of the fact that the disease can jump up at any time. Uh, we, we, we cannot make assumptions that just because the disease is on the way down now that it's, on a, it's, on, it's going to keep going down and then we're going to get a number of months to get ready for a second wave. We may get a second peak in this wave. This happened during pandemics in the past. It certainly happened in the pandemic uh, of 1919 and the Spanish flu. Uh, we, we got a second peak, not necessarily a second wave. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, right now, uh, countries in Europe, countries in North America, many other countries around the world and Southeast Asia have to continue to 
uh, put in place the, 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 the public health and social measures, the surveillance measures, the public health measures, the testing measures, and a comprehensive strategy to ensure that we continue on a downward trajectory and that we don't uh, have an immediate second peak. Uh, we will then have to look later in the year um, whether or not uh, there's a possibility of a second wave of infections coming, and that's particularly uh, of concern when we look at the possibility of having a second wave of infections that may be also associated with, our, uh, with influenza season, which will greatly uh, complicate things uh, for disease control. So if I may add, um, yes, I mean, let us be perfectly clear. Um, all countries need to, be re need to remain on high alert here. All countries need to be ready to rapidly detect cases. Even countries that have had success in suppression, as Mike has said, even countries that have seen a, a decline in cases must remain ready. Um, the seroprevalence studies that we have seen, um, there are two published studies. There are an additional approximately 20 uh, studies that are either in preprint, which means they haven't been published in a peer-reviewed journal or have made results available through press release, indicate that a large proportion of the population remains susceptible. That means that this virus, if it finds an opportunity, will start an outbreak. And we need to be very clear on that and need to be, remain strong, remain vigilant, have our systems in place to readily detect those cases, to care for those cases, to find and trace and quarantine contacts. Um, this virus, um, as I said at my first press conference on this, on the 14th of January, a hallmark of coronaviruses is its ability to amplify in certain settings, its ability to cause uh, transmission or super spreading events. And we are seeing in a number of situations in these closed settings, when the virus has an opportunity, it can transmit readily. We're seeing it in long-term care facilities. We've seen it in some hospitals. That means that the virus will take that opportunity to amplify if it can. Um, but the good news is that we have the steps, the tools in our toolbox to be able to suppress transmission. And these are the fundamentals of public health um, that Dr. Tedros, Dr. Moedi has talked about. It's about uh, having that public health workforce in place, um, having the ability to test for cases, to care for those cases, depending on the severity of their symptoms, to find those contacts, to quarantine those contacts, to keep our people, to keep all people fully empowered, engaged, and informed about what the situation is in their setting. Um, and these are the tools that we can use to suppress transmission. I think I will, I, I will add to that. Um, uh, today, uh, as you may know, uh, Japan, the Prime Minister Abe uh, had announced the lifting of the emergency declaration uh, that was imposed actually more than uh, six week, weeks ago. And if you see the number of cases at its peak, it was um, more than 700 per day. Now it's down to around 40 cases per day. And the number of deaths is also kept at, at minimum. So we can see also the success of Japan. But at the same time, as Maria said, they will continue to do the case identification, the tracing, the proper care, isolation, that will still be there. So lifting some of the uh, serious measures doesn't mean that uh, the basics uh, will, not be, will, mo will not be done it should actually be strengthened. That's why we say the social distancing should help to prepare for testing, uh, tracing, and, 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 and the rest. So we see it in, in many countries, and including uh, the Japan's lifting of the uh, declaration uh, today. Uh, and we um, remind all, all countries who are lifting uh, the serious measures they had to make sure that the public health measures, the comprehensive approach is, is in, in place and the right instruments are actually continuing to be implemented. Thank you. I think um, uh, Dr. John, the director of CDC, is online and um, would be happy to give him the floor to uh, 
make his speech, and then if we can continue the question and answer after after that, and he can join us on that too. Uh, Margaret, if you agree. That would be great. Dr. John, I hope you can hear us, and please go ahead. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Good. Uh, good evening from Addis Ababa, and greetings from the African Union Commission, where we are celebrating the Africa Day uh, under the banner of solidarity. So I think uh, there couldn't have been a better moment that for choosing that word solidarity than today, where we need solidarity to fight and win this battle against COVID-19, especially uh, for our continent, where we continue to see uh, a progression in the numbers of uh, infections occurring every day on our continent, and it's extremely uh, uh, concerning. I would echo what uh, Dr. Tedros mentioned, where our greatest chance, I've been speaking over the entire day at the AU and advocating for the need to enforce our public health measures and other uh, uh, critical activities that will allow us to win this battle against COVID-19 on the continent. A battle that we must win to survive for our own existence as a continent, which means we have to intensify our ability to test, our ability to trace, our ability to track, and our ability to treat as a continent. And I'm very pleased that the leadership of the continent has rallied behind that. The chairperson of the African Union as uh, uh, Chairperson Musa Faki, under the, of course, the guidance and leadership of President Amaphosa as the chair of the AU, have all endorsed this approach and they're rallying behind. So I'm particularly pleased to work side by side with WHO uh, uh, to uh, continue to benefit from the support, extraordinary support from both uh, 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 my friend, Dr. Chidi Moeti and uh, Dr. Tedros to continue to join forces in the fight against COVID on the continent. A fight which, as I said, we must win to survive. And as a continent, I'm really happy that we are aligning ourselves with the values and principles of what WHO is putting forward. Thank you. I will participate for about another 15 minutes and run over to uh, take part in my own webinar, which is going on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John, for joining us. So if you can stay for questions, we would appreciate it. Otherwise, please, please feel free. Thank you, Margaret, please. So now we'll resume the questions and answers with uh, Helen Branswell from Stat News. Helen, please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I just wanted to follow up on Kai's question, uh, just to be 100% clear. The pausing of the hydrochloroquine, um, hydroxychloroquine arm of the solidarity trial is not related to any rep um, signals that the DS, uh, the, the Data Safety and Monitoring Board has seen? No, uh, Ellen, no, not at all. Uh, that data, that's what we're pausing to analyze that data, not us, but the DSMB and the statisticians will analyze that data and inform us accordingly. So as such, it is not related to any problem. There is no problem uh, at all right now within the solidarity trial. There's no issue. There is no signal. We're just acting on an abundance of caution uh, based on the, the recent results from other studies to, to ensure that we can continue safely with that arm of the trial. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, the next question comes from Brazil, from Ana Pinto, from Fola de Sao Paulo. Ana, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for taking my question. As of today, Brazil has the second highest number of infections in the world, over 350,000, with over 22,000 deaths, and a reproduction number that has been over one for several weeks. And in many cities, the ICU's occupation rate is over 90%. In such a scenario, is it possible to prevent a public health collapse without restriction measures, such as stay-at-home orders? If it's possible, what are the alternatives to control the pandemic in Brazil, given its current epidemiological numbers? Thank you. Um, the transmission in, in Brazil uh, at this moment is quite intense, but uh, we would also we've seen increasing uh, 
transmission in countries uh, like uh, Chile, in, in Peru, uh, and a number of uh, South American countries. Um, with regard to suppressing infection when there is widespread community transmission, uh, it's, uh, when we've said this way back since February, you, you, you must continue to do uh, all of, all of everything you can. And there is a perception that you can, you can only suppress transmission through uh, uh, very extreme public health and social measures. Certainly in very high transmission, it's a very effective means of uh, asking people to stay home in order to reduce the flames of the epidemic. Uh, but then that you need to do case finding, you need to investigate clusters, you need to isolate cases. In, in a sense, extreme measures uh, are very often used as an alternative. What we do is we put, make everybody stay at home uh, while we try and sort out what to do next. And that's essentially what many countries ended up doing. Um, what we really would like is to be in a position where we can identify cases and contacts and those cases can be isolated and their contacts can be quarantined. It is a much more effective strategy to do that uh, and effectively only isolate or quarantine a small proportion of the population um, as opposed to having to isolate or, or effectively have uh, the whole population in a stay-at-home mode. We all know the, the downsides of doing that economically and socially. However, in, in, in these kinds of circumstances, there may be no alternative, because if you do not have the capacity to do the kind of tracing, the kind of detection, the testing that's needed, it's very, very demanding. Um, and sometimes uh, countries have, understandably, uh, not been able to do that work while they try to suppress. What countries have done in implementing these public health and social measures widely in lockdowns, uh, what they're known as, they've put in place the measures to be able to investigate disease, investigate clusters, they've increased their public health workforce, they've increased their testing capacity. So then as the numbers drop, they get control of the situation again. Um, so yes, at this moment in countries with high levels of transmission, unless they've got tremendous capacities to investigate cases and isolate cases and quarantine contacts and do widespread testing. Uh, at this point, it is very difficult to see how countries with very intense transmission can suppress the infection without some level of public health and social measures uh, being put in place. Uh, the extent of those, and some countries have demonstrated that it is possible to suppress the disease without full-scale lockdowns. Um, certainly countries in Southeast Asia have demonstrated that. But that has only been in situations where they were able to put in place extensive other measures like case finding and surveillance and contact tracing and testing and quarantine. Uh, it's never been a situation where a country's had intense transmission and it just goes away by itself. That has not happened as yet. Countries with intense transmission have all had to implement some level of uh, public health and social measures. In Brazil, Many of the states are trying to implement such measures, and certainly it's not that the state level in Brazil is not implementing measures, they are. I think there is a variation in the measures being implemented, uh, and uh, there needs to be a whole of government, all of society approach uh, to that. But certainly there are many countries now in Central and South America dealing with intense transmission. And again, as the Director General has said over again and over again, we need a comprehensive approach. It's not just public health and social measures or lockdowns. It's not just tracing and case identification. It's not just testing. It's not just quarantine. It's all of these things done together. If countries do that, then easing restrictions can be done much faster and much more safely. Maybe I could, I could add to that. Um, if you don't take the um, uh, serious, uh, I mean, um, serious social measure, measures like social distancing and so on, as you rightly said, the speed of the virus will, be, will continue to be high. In order to beat the virus, you need to be, you need to uh, have a speed which is, which is faster than the virus itself, meaning you have to take these measures to slow it and then prepare the, the public health approach that Mike, Mike said, and then you will be ahead of the virus. So that's the whole uh, uh, idea. While the virus has all the spaces and moving everywhere as it can, with the speed it can really use, you can't beat it. So that's why it's like a roadblock. You, you have the social 
distancing measures and other social measures to slow that. And during that measure, when you do the lockdown or whatever, that's when you develop also your, con your uh, testing, your contact tracing, uh, you increase your surge of uh, personnel who will do the contact tracing and other, other measures, then that will give you to be ahead of the virus. You slow and then ahead, ahead, ahead of it. So that's the whole uh, uh, idea. Otherwise, if you let it go, if um, it has all the spaces to move as, as it wishes, um, if you don't uh, increase your speed by slowing the virus's speed, it will be very difficult to control it. So um, uh, I think that's why we need the um, uh, what so-called lockdowns or, or social distancing measures to really prepare ourselves and move faster than the virus itself. And we said it many times, this virus is very, very dangerous. It has two combinations, two dangerous combinations. One, it can move faster, very fast, and at the same time, it's a killer. And that's why um, you can see what you can see, 5 million uh, cases, more than 5 million, and more than 300,000 deaths. Um, in many countries, it has shown that after a certain number of cases, after a certain threshold, it moves like a bushfire, exponential. It did it in China, in Wuhan. It did it in many European countries. And it's doing it now, in, as, as you said, in, in Brazil. It really moves fast. That's why we need to do everything to slow it. And the slowing is mainly in the social uh, measures, social distancing measures that we take. And they have to be as really aggressive as possible to give us uh, the time to be ahead of the virus. So it's a matter of uh, speed and we should control its speed using different methods. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, we're now moving to Morocco for a question that will be asked in Arabic. And this will be asked by Abdella Uhassan from Morocco Media News. Uh, Abdella, please go ahead. Marhaban. Shukran lakum ala dawati. Asu'al katali. لا يعتبر رش المعقمات والمطاهرات لمحاربة فيروس كورونا خطرا على صحة الإنسان وهل تشكل خطرا على البيئة والكائنات الحية الأخرى مع العلم أن أغلب الدول تقوم بعملية تعقيم بشكل مستمر برش أنواع من المواد الكيماوية المعتمدة وهل هناك أعراض لفيروس كورونا تلزم الأشخاص المتعافون من هذا المرض شكرا لكم Thanks. I heard the question. Yeah, the question was about the, the use of detergents and disinfectants, and, and the question was if it was safe sometimes and, and not safe other times. So um, the use of detergents and disinfectants for the cleaning of surfaces is very important for a virus like COVID-19. Um, so when people, infected individuals um, who transmit the virus, they transmit through these infectious droplets and sometimes those droplets can fall onto the surfaces around them and in the environment that's around them, whether that's at home or whether that's in a healthcare facility. So um, the virus can survive for, for a small amount of time, but if you use a disinfectant, it can deactivate, it can kill the virus uh, within minutes. So the use of the disinfectants there is, is very important. Um, and that's where disinfectants are safe. Um, in no other situation is the use of disinfectants for uh, COVID-19 um, safe, and certainly not people using uh, disinfectants. Yeah, and if we could just add as well that the, the widespread use of uh, disinfectants at the community level, and we've, we've all seen the images of large amounts of disinfectants being sprayed in the air and whatever. I mean, these disinfectants can cause irritation to the skin, they can cause irritation to the eyes. So again, we're focused here on surfaces that people will potentially touch uh, and doing that carefully. Uh, there are some disinfectants, for example, that are currently being used on airlines, which are sprayed in the airplane when there are no passengers. Uh, those sprays are electrostatically charged. 
what they're aimed at doing is they will attach themselves to surfaces and then disinfect the surface. But the, we need to be very careful in using sprayed disinfectants in areas where there are large numbers of people. So the, 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 the large scale sort of spraying of environments uh, in which there are large numbers of people is, is not necessarily effective. Uh, and therefore, we should focus on disinfecting surfaces that people will touch uh, and doing that uh, properly um, and, and avoiding uh, flooding disinfectants into the environment and, and potentially causing uh, skin and eye irritation, particularly in children. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, now, the next question is from John Cohen from Science. John, please go ahead. John Cohen, uh, could you unmute yourself and ask your Hi. question? Ah, there you are. Yeah, thank you. thanks for taking my question. I'm, I'm curious about the seasonality relationship to a second wave. When we talk about second waves, I think we're largely looking at influenza, which has a seasonality pattern. And are you thinking of a second wave based on there being the assumption of seasonality? And if there is no seasonality, what determines the second wave? It's confusing to me. John, thanks for that question. You, you reminded me that I, I meant to add an additional point to the last question. The use of the word waves, the use of the word seasonality implies that indeed we have some information about how this virus will behave over years and over many, many months. Um, and most people think when they hear seasonality, they think influenza. And they think, uh, you know, northern hemisphere winter season, southern hemisphere winter season, and, and it may get bad. Uh, we are five months into this pandemic. Um, we have five months worth of data on COVID-19. Uh, we do have some experience with SARS. We do have some experience with MERS. We do have some experience with other human coronaviruses. But there is nothing right now to indicate that um, this virus will resurge in winter months. Um, what we know is that from the seroepidemiology studies is that many people remain susceptible. And that means if the virus is there, regardless of the temperature, regardless of the month, that virus can infect people. And if people are in close contact with one another, it can resurge. Um, the complication becomes if we think of waves, if we think of, of winter months, if we think of flu, is when we have uh, co-infection or co-circulation of influenza and COVID-19, as we are seeing in the southern hemisphere, that could complicate our understanding because if we don't have testing in place, we don't know what people are infected with. And so it, will, it could potentially flood the system. It could potentially overwhelm the system. But specifically to your question about waves and about seasonality, we don't have enough information right now to know how this virus will behave over many years. What we know and what we need to prepare for is that the virus can resurge if we give it an opportunity. We don't need a winter, winter months to be able to do that in the Northern Hemisphere. We are seeing re increases in a number of countries. And I've, as I've said previously, all countries need to remain on high alert in terms of their ability to detect cases and have this comprehensive package and this approach of finding, isolating, testing, caring for cases, uh, tracing contacts, quarantining those contacts, caring for individuals, empowering the population, um, making sure that we have all of our public health infrastructure in place to deal with COVID-19 and deal with all of the other diseases that are affecting our countries. And if I could just add, uh, John, that, that's why I used the word uh, second peak, because uh, we would tend to talk about waves of infection uh, in terms of uh, uh, the natural history of a disease in the absence of control measures, the natural phenomenon of waves of disease, which may reflect uh, seasonality, uh, they may reflect uh, the population behaviour dur during different seasons, the amount to which people mix or are indoors. So, so there are factors that may drive the natural transmission dynamics during different seasons. It's not that the season itself, the temperature may affect the disease, but in many cases it's not necessarily the temperature. It may be the fact that in wintertime people are indoors more, they're in much more contact with each other. So there are the natural phenomenon. Uh, I think many countries have paid a heavy price in doing the measures that have needed to be done to suppress 
the transmission of this disease. And they deserve credit, and the communities deserve credit for the efforts and the sacrifices they've made to break chains of transmission. And that has driven down and suppressed virus transmission. Uh, it would be, uh, I think, uh, at this point, um, uh, a, a little bit uh, worrisome if people assume that the downward trend in disease has occurred naturally. I don't think any of us believe that that has occurred naturally. That has occurred because of very, very, very tough public health measures that have been tough on the population. And if we assume that, if we take that uh, to be true, if we take the fact that we've pressured the virus, we've pressured transmission and we've driven transmission down, then the corollary, the opposite, is true that if we take the pressure off the virus, then the virus can bounce back. And that's where we are right now. If we can, what's, what's happened in, in many countries is that countries that have managed to keep transmission low or have managed to suppress transmission down to a low level have then found it relatively straightforward to contain the disease after that. They found a level of disease at which their public health system, their testing, their tracing, their contact tracing, their isolation, their quarantine, their healthcare system can maintain a status quo. It reaches a steady state. And we hope we can retain and maintain low levels or no transmission over time. And then we'll see what happens with the second wave concept later on. And that may still be an issue. My concern right now is that people may be assuming that the current drop in infections represents a natural seasonality. Uh, and I think that's a dangerous assumption. I think uh, a huge effort has been made to suppress transmission of this virus and to remove pressure from the virus at this point, making an assumption that it's on a downward trajectory and the real next danger point is sometime in October or November. Um, I think that will be a dangerous assumption. I think this virus is under pressure because communities, public health authorities around the world are putting the virus under pressure by reducing the opportunity for the virus to transmit. If we give too much of an opportunity back to the virus to transmit, as the DG said, if we let the virus get ahead of us again and we don't have the systems in place to be faster than the virus, the danger is we could rapidly get back to a second peak uh, and in fact maybe just experiencing the first step on, a, on an ever increasing trend. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, we're getting, we've gone well over the hour, so we're giving the last question to Nina at AFP. Nina, are you on the line? Please go ahead. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Very well, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, so I had a question on um, China's foreign minister who yesterday said that uh, the country was open to international cooperation on identifying the source of the novel coronavirus and uh, suggested that WHO probably should lead that investigation. I was just wondering, has the WHO now been invited to China to take part in such a probe? And if so, when would you expect such an investigation to start? Thank you very much. Um. Maria, I wish to, to add, we, we've been in, in discussions day-to-day uh, uh, -day with our colleagues in China about uh, putting together the, nece the necessary scientific inquiries into the origin of the virus. I think the authorities in China, governments around the world and ourselves are very keen to understand the animal origin of the virus itself. Uh, and I uh, am very pleased uh, to hear a very consistent message uh, coming from China, which is one of, of openness to, to, such a, to such an approach. And, and again, pleased that we've seen, for example, the, uh, the publication of the first peer-reviewed journal publications of the vaccine studies uh, from, from China. Uh, and again, I think uh, in terms of the, the number of scientific publications, that have come from China over the last number of months is 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 uh, uh, is, is very good, and the number of uh, scientific collaborations between Chinese institutions and institutions all over the world is also a very positive sign. So I think uh, we will be very pleased to continue those discussions. I don't believe, Maria, there's a date yet for for a, uh, for a scientific uh, mission, uh, but uh, we will be look forward be looking forward to doing that as soon as possible and with the, the right mix of scientific uh, experts from a multinational perspective to join such a team. Yes. 
comments only to add that, um, yes, we have been in regular contact with our, our colleagues in, in China, and they have all the expertise in country to be able to do this. Um, we welcome the opportunity to work with them um, and, and with the international community um, to really understand uh, the virus origins and the animal-human interface because of the public health importance of this. Um, SARS-CoV-2 virus the COVID that causes COVID-19 is a, is a zoonotic pathogen. Um, and it's important for us to understand the intermediary host of, of this particular virus so that we can work towards preventing something like this happening again. Um, as we all know, uh, as you all know now, you know, most of these emerging pathogens do come from animals. So it's important that we have a, a strong system in place and we're working with our partners at FAO and OIE, our, our sister agencies, uh, to be able to work towards surveillance in animals and at the animal-human interface. So we welcome this opportunity uh, to go forward. But I do want to make one other point from the last question, and I don't know if DG would like to comment on this as well, is, is the idea of complacency. Uh, one of the things I've been asked recently, of what worries me the most, and it, and it is complacency, and it relates to the last question in terms of what our expectations are of this and waves and, and what might happen. Um, you know, we here at WHO and with our regional offices and country offices are planning for any scenarios. Um, you know, there's a certain predictability of this virus, but any time you become complacent and you think you know, it will surprise you. And this virus has an opportunity and it will take advantage, every advantage that it can, to resurge, to transmit. And so um, I, I understand very well, and I am in the same boat as you, we all want this to be over, but we have a long way to go. We're at the beginning of this, and we must continue to, to really stay strong and not become complacent, and I know that that is very hard. So it's something that we are conscious of, um, and we are uh, ensuring that, that we are working with you, you know, to support you through this, um, but it is important that we don't become complacent. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to add to the first one. Um, as you know, uh, with um, China, we have uh, agreed on two issues. Uh, and the origin of the study of the origin of the virus is not actually new. Uh, we have agreed on uh, having international experts to visit the country, which was done in uh, February. And this was also agreed during that time uh, on the origins also. So it has been there on the table. It's a matter of uh, continuing and, and doing it. But um, all stakeholders understand the importance of studying the origin because it's by studying the origin that, can, that we can prevent it from happening in, 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 in the future. So uh, this I, is not a new thing, as Mike and Maria said, something that has been already uh, going on. You know, the discussion has been going on and something that uh, there was already uh, agreement. Thank you. Margaret, um, just before you finish, I just <clears throat> I know the DG has uh, very much recognized our, our colleagues on the African continent, but just from a, a personal perspective to say uh, thank you to, uh, to Chidi and our team in Afro, to uh, John and his teams in, in Addis Ababa. Uh, these teams uh, have not only been fighting COVID, but <clears throat> have been 500% committed to so many epidemics in Africa, and particularly uh, the Ebola outbreak in, in Congo, DR Congo, over the last year and a half. I think uh, uh, African clinicians, epidemiologists, nurses, uh, um, public health physicians, so many others in Africa have sacrificed so much over the years to protect populations in Africa, but also of populations around the world, uh, and they've done that with limited resources, with limited investment, but with huge professionalism, professionalism huge courage. Uh, I just wanted to, on this Africa Day, just uh, say thank you from the world to our African colleagues for all they do uh, to protect the world from emerging and infectious diseases. And I'd also like to ask Dr. Moetti if she's got any f of closing remarks, also Dr. So. Dr. Moetti, would you like to say a few words? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I think what I'd like to, to say is very much to support and echo your core message of we are not complacent. 
So these, these apparently low numbers in Africa, the low proportion of cases, of the global cases that Africa represents, I think is in the context of very challenged systems where we to see a big wave of cases coming in the region. So for me, this emphasizes the need for our governments to continue, expand. We're advising them very strongly to utilize the capacity both for the public health actions, uh, organize our capacity to provide care and treatment while we continue to ensure the availability of essential services for, 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 for the population. So it's just to say we encourage continuing. We will not also let down our guard at all. And we are absolutely determined to work with our partners, with the African Union, with professionals in Africa, with civil society, and very importantly, with communities and people where it's our duty to help people understand and to help them feel empowered and enabled to take the actions that they need to take because they are not the subjects of government interventions. Things work best if people themselves understand and take the actions that are needed. So again, a shout out for African people. I thank them so much for the courage that they've showed, the forbearance under sometimes difficult circumstances, and we are committed to continue in this fight with them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moeti and Dr. Professor So. Have you got any final remarks you'd like to make? We can't. Uh, Professor So, would you like to unmute yourself? Thank you. Uh, shall I say okay here? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, just to really thank again uh, WHO for organizing this and thank to uh, CDC Africa for um, joining. I would like just to echo a few things. Um, Dr. Mweti said exactly what I wanted to, to say. Uh, one, we, you know, having few cases or small number of cases, African cases compared to uh, Europe and Asia, uh, very, very small. It doesn't mean that there is no case. It doesn't mean that the problem cannot be big one day. Uh, in the near future. So we just have to continue to be careful and to maintain and to, 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 to strengthen our, our entire uh, uh, community system, strengthen our entire public health system. So I fully agree with uh, Dr. Moiti there. And because if we don't be careful, what can happen in Africa will continue to have uh, to be at this plateau level for a long, long time. And that could be a big problem. Uh, we are already seeing small, small over epidemics coming in. Mike just mentioned this. It's not only Ebola. We are seeing measles epidemic in some places and so on and so on. So we don't want to be overwhelmed uh, in places where the health system is already uh, very weak. And, and lastly, I would like to add <clears throat> one last point on to the uh, use of antiseptics uh, for hands and for surfaces. Uh, in, in places, uh, many places like Africa, it will be difficult to get those things. If, if one doesn't be careful, people can in fact bring bad, bad products and, and say that they are, uh, they are good antiseptic. So we, we strongly recommend hand washing, soap and water. Soap and water is, is very, very good uh, uh, compared to, to uh, this very modern uh, product that can <clears throat> not one uh, harm you, hurt you, uh, break your skin, your eyes, etc. But second, uh, soap and water is, is, is really heavily, highly, highly recommended also as, as part of this uh, hygiene measure. So I, I would like to fin finish by thanking WHO for, for his leadership and in many ways, many ways, many ways, uh, not only communication, not only disease control, but uh, many other ways uh, 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 WHO is doing uh, a fantastic job around the world, and I would like to thank them all for that. And thank you for helping uh, uh, not only Africa, the entire world, but especially African countries uh, to promote uh, many of these this, uh, research operations uh, that are ongoing, uh, solidarity serial surveys, solidarity trials, uh, solidarity chemotherapy trials, solidarity vaccine trials. These are all great, great ideas. So we hope that uh, uh, Africa will be really uh, as uh, Moiti said, <clears throat> uh, we will try to stop this very quickly in Africa and start to, to, to save lives uh, very quickly in, in Africa in collaboration with Africans and, and African countries. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor So. I uh, will conclude this press conference with final remarks by Dr. Tedros. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Siri, for joining. Thank you, John, and thank you, Samba. Thank you to all for joining, and uh, the journalists and others also who have joined us today. And happy Africa Day. Thank you so much. <laughs>